Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Well, I hope you are in, uh, enjoying working through Galatians. I, I really am. It has uh, caused me to rethink some things. That's one of the, that's one of the uh, healthy and painful things about Christianity is that we continue to grow and understand more about the Bible when confronted with different understandings that we didn't see last time we went through this material. And it's been an exciting time for me. I hope it has for you. I'm going to be finishing chapter 4 tonight, verses 21 through 31. And uh, I must admit that, again, Paul is doing something that um, uh, I feel somewhat uncomfortable with. Uh, and I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about what I believe Paul is doing. 21 through 31 is a... Paul uses the word allegory in verse 24, and he is going to cap his argument of the, the way of the promise versus the way of works righteousness using an Old Testament, he calls it an allegory, I would call it a typology, but um, I guess the thing that, uh, that bothers me the most about Paul doing this, and Jesus does the very same thing in in Matthew 13 with the parable of the soils. Is that I guess I'm so nervous about what the early church did with allegorizing that I'm, I'm afraid of this as an approach to Bible study. So let, let me for a moment work through with you what I'm talking about. Um... I am not going to try to be tacky, but I am going to try to be understandable. My experience in the American church the last uh, two or three decades, as far as preaching goes, has not been real positive. And it's not that I don't think that preachers are giving me spiritual truth, but that quite often what they do is read a passage from the Bible, and the whole purpose of reading a passage is to say, I'm speaking, thus saith the Lord. That's why we read the Bible before we preach. We give a sense of authority to what we're saying by quoting the Bible. But quite often what is read from the Bible has little or nothing to do with what's said after that. And sometimes there's very little connection between what's said and what was just read. As I have struggled with this, I have come to define biblical authority as not reading the Bible before we preach or quoting often from the Bible during our sermons. But that biblical authority is understanding what the original author was saying to his day and then applying that truth to my day. And I have no other right than to tell you what this inspired author said. I have no authority to add to the Word of God and I have no authority to bend it to make it address an issue or a subject that it wasn't originally meant to address. Now, that does mean that I am limited in what I can say as far as from the Bible. If we don't put some limitations on sermons and Christian literature and books and Sunday school things, how do we ever know or judge when somebody is accurately handling the word of truth? Now, the reason I guess I'm so, uh, well, I'm just uptight about this is because this became the predominant method of proclamation in the, in, in the first 1,500 years of the church. 
And many of the great people you know in the history of the church used this allegorical method. And so I would like to take just a moment to say what I think are some strengths of the allegorical method and some weaknesses of the allegorical method. And then I want to tell you what I think Paul is doing in, a, in a Galatians 4. I hope you can kind of keep with me and, and think what I'm saying. I think it's extremely important. I brought a little book that really has helped me kind of work through this. This is called, Has the Church Misread the Bible? by Moises Silva. As I look back at the history of the church, I think the church has misread the Bible. And what she has done is force the Bible to speak to this day or that day when the Bible wasn't intended to speak to this day or that day in that way. We've asked the Bible a whole lot of questions it wasn't designed to answer. And much of the struggle in the early church over theology is the struggle with Greek philosophy, not biblical theology. The allegorical method did attempt to use the Old Testament as a Christian document. That's a strength. It believed that there was a unity between the Old Testament and New, and that the Old Testament did talk about Christ. I certainly agree with that. It did follow the example to some extent of Jesus and Paul, who both use allegory to some degree. It attempted to relate the gospel to its own day. I think Bible interpretation, no matter how good it is, that does not apply that truth to our day, is not complete. So allegory's main purpose was in application, not in understanding. I think they both have to go together. Either side without the other is disaster. And number four, and, and that's, that's the, all the strengths. Now, I want to give you what I think is the weaknesses of this method. And you say, well, Bob, why are you giving us the, the weaknesses of a method that is way back in church history? I want you to know allegory is alive and lives in Henderson and Marshall and Texas and the U.S. and the 20th century. Whenever we take the Bible and make it say something it never intended to say, I'm sometimes appalled at what I see in Sunday school literature has no connection with the text in context, but just deals with a current issue that we want to deal with. We don't have that right. The problem is it imported meaning into a Bible text that was never meant to be there by the original author. And who gives anybody the right to do that? Number two, it forced a hidden meaning behind every text. This is what it seems to say, but this is what it really says. I've been amazed in some of the Bible studies I've been in that try to go back into Obadiah 3 and find some major truth the church has never seen before. And people would say, wasn't that great? Wasn't that deep? It was deep, all right. Deep out of imagination. God has put everything on the table for the common man. You believe that? We don't need gurus. We don't need PhDs. We don't need some special book. The Bible is on the table for the common man. Amen? No hidden meanings. Number three, it put forth fanciful and far-fetched interpretations. It made things stand for philosophical truths or spiritual truths. The Good Samaritan, for example, is turned into a story about the devil and the demons and getting to heaven instead of a racial outcast helping somebody. Number four, it did not allow words and sentences to bear their obvious normal meanings. Some people think the Bible's written in Holy Spirit Greek. It is not. It's written in the Greek of the street, the Greek of the common man, not the scholar. There was a scholarly Greek. It's not written in that. The Bible is not for the academic setting. It's for the man on the street. Hallelujah. Number five, it allowed human subjectivity to dominate the plain message of the original author. It's, when I hear preaching that's done in this spiritualizing or allegorizing way, it says far much more about the cleverness of the speaker than it does the power of the Word of God. I'm sometimes amazed that we teach young preachers how to, how to alliterate their messages. 
three points and well illustrated, alliterated, a certain structure. I don't want an alliterated structure. I want the Word of God. Because there's three P's in a deathbed story doesn't mean God's in it. I'm getting a little emotional, I know. Number six, there are no controls on this kind of interpretation. The Holy Spirit told me last night, this is my studied opinion. This really moves me. Well, how do I know? What? Maybe he ate hot sauce too late. I've got to have some way to verify this. If, if it's going to change my life, if it's going to affect my eternity, I've got to have some guidelines, some boundaries, some way to check what this person is saying. There's no way to do that if you don't go with the normal sense of the language that was intended by the author to his original audience. There are no controls. Number seven, Martin Luther called this, this allegorizing, spiritualizing, a monkey game, a sort of beautiful harlot. Number eight, it must be admitted that both Jesus, Matthew 13, and Paul, Galatians 4, use typology. I can't deny that, but I would say this. I've been amazed through the years of how many preachers find far more types than Paul and Jesus ever thought about. I've come to the place, this has been so abused that I don't let anybody use the type unless a New Testament author introduces it. To find some type. And it's been stuff like this in my experience. A crossing the Red Sea is salvation and crossing the Jordan River is the second blessing. Yuck! I can teach fairies out of the Bible using that approach. The tabernacle furniture forms a cross. We don't even know what the shape of the cross was. There's, there's nothing in the Bible to allow us to allegorize the tabernacle or allegorize the wilderness wandering period or allegorize uh, uh, David's table that feeds Mephibosheth as some, some spiritual deep truth that the author never saw. We have no right to do that to the Bible. Number nine. I'm almost through my little tirade. It needs to be admitted that early Orthodox theologians were from Alexandria, Egypt, and did use this method. God used this approach and interpretation to speak to several centuries of Christians. You know, um, have you ever heard somebody do this? They ask God a question and then let their Bible fall open and do this. You ever heard that? Now, I think God, I think God can use that for new Christians who don't know how to do it, who are looking for answers, um, baby Christians or whatever. But I tell you, for those who understand that the Bible is a message and not a magic book, that becomes a great sin beyond infancy. And though God used this method to, to convert generations of believers, this method has been terribly abused in our day. And people say, well, Bob, it's not that big a deal. The gospel's being proclaimed. If I don't hold Christian preachers to some form of verification and consistency, the cult leaders are going to eat our lunch with our own methods and our own book. They're going to find the wheel of karma and the new age and everything else in this book if we let somebody say, ooh, 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 ooh I got goosebumps when I found this truth. Well, I don't take an aspirin, go to bed and read it tomorrow. I don't want your goosebumps. I want what Paul said to the Galatians. And then I want to give you the evidence of where I got it from. Historical setting, literary context, grammatical structure, word studies and parallel passages and if I can't back it up for you you don't have to believe what I say or act on it but if I back it up and show you it's the word of God in context and show you that's what Paul's saying to his I think you're encumbered as a Christian to at least begin to study it and pray about it now what bothers me is that I don't think Paul is doing this in the fourth chapter I think he's using a typology now I want to show you why I think he's doing that and um, I hope you'll uh, Open your Bibles up and kind of follow with me here for a minute. It looks to me like from chapter 4, verse 7. Now, what I'm doing is a contextual flow with you. Now, follow what I'm saying. In chapter 4, verse 7, is where he's kind of cut off his discussion about sonship and heirship. He's really made a big deal about that we're children of the promise. We're children through Abraham. We're full heirs with the spiritual descendants of Abraham, not through Moses, through Abraham. And you can see in verses 6 and 7, we're talking about heirship and sonship. Then notice there's a paragraph division in chapter 4, verse 8, that runs pretty much down to 20. Now, mine has 
a couple of p- paragraphs in, in between there. But this is Paul's emotional, highly emotional discussion with these uh, Galatian Christians again. And he really doesn't come back to his argument about sonship and heirship until verse 21. So it looks like to me that we're continuing this. Now, I, I want to go over this. It's a rather lengthy note. And uh, I just want, if you have your notes on chapter 5 or, or chapter 4 with you, you have this. If not, just think through what I'm saying. I think what Paul is doing here is, is trying to bring the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 and compare it to the covenant of Moses. Now, there's three covenants we're talking about. Abraham, Moses, and the covenant of Jesus. And what Paul is saying is the covenant of Jesus, the new covenant of Jeremiah, relates better to the promise of Abraham in how Gentiles are made right with God than it does with the legal system of Moses on how a person is made right with God. Now you say, but why would he use allegory? Well, really, I think it's typology, and i tell you why. Number one, Paul does not deny the historical setting of Genesis. He's going to play on Genesis 16, which is the birth of Ishmael through Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, and Genesis 21, which is the, the promised child through Sarah, Isaac. And he's going to say, now, if probably these Judaizers made a big deal about being the sons of Abraham. Maybe these Judaizers even brought up this same allegory is why Paul is using it. Maybe this allegory just fits. And Paul says, I believe the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, there's one mind that created them both, the Holy Spirit, and there are similarities between the Old and the New, and he's bringing out those similarities in the different children of Abraham. And maybe he was saying to the, Gen- to the Judaizers, you're right, there are different children of Abraham, and you more fit in line with this one. And I, I think that's what he's doing. Now, notice how this kind of connects up. There are two mothers, Hagar and Sarah, that stand for two families. There is tension between these two mothers and their children. Uh, Both groups are descendants of Abraham, but one is in bondage, meaning it's not a free person, it's kind of the child of a concubine situation, and the other is the child of promise. Um, There are two mountains. We relate one son to the covenant connected with this mountain and another son to another mountain. And uh, I think you you can kind of see what's happening here about that. So, I think Paul used this because in Genesis 21, 9 and 10, it talks about drive off the son of the slave girl. And I think what Paul really wanted to say is you need to drive off the Judaizers. And uh, that's kind of the play that I see through here. It's a play on sonship and heirship going back uh, to Abraham. So with that in mind, let's, let's go to the Bible then and look at verse 21 and just kind of walk through this together. Tell me, you do want to be subject to the law. Now, he's talking to Galatian Christians who have not yet been circumcised, but some of them are thinking about going that way to trust Christ, but also uh, become Jewish. And he says, will you not listen to what the law says? Now, what he's saying is he's he's going to use Moses' writing to counteract a false teaching based on Moses. It kind of makes pretty logical sense, doesn't it? He's going to quote the law to show the law is not the way. He's going to do it in a very Jewish fashion, which probably matched exactly the way these Judaizers did it. For the scripture says that Abraham had two sons. Genesis 16 is Ishmael. Genesis 21 is... Abraham had more children than that. This does not even mention the children of Keturah. I believe that's in 25. One by a slave girl, Hagar, and one by a free woman, Sarah. But the child of the slave girl was born in the ordinary course of nature. How did Abraham have the child Ishmael? There was nothing spiritual about it. There was nothing uh, prophesied about it. He took the woman. In natural means, she got pregnant. In natural means, she had a child. So Ishmael is the natural, normal child of uh, Abraham and Hagar. 
Okay, no, that's understandable. No problem there. Uh, while the child of the free one was, was to fulfill the promise. This is the promise mentioned, uh, mentioned several times, Genesis 15 and 17, that Abraham's going to have a child by his wife, Sarah. And uh, Sarah is old and Abraham is old and they tried all their life and they still connect. Did you know it was 13 years between when God confronted Abraham in Genesis 12 and said, I'll give you a child? 13 years later, Isaac was born in 21. And Abraham had to walk by faith, had to believe God through all that. Matter of fact, Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed God he was going to have a child is the reason God accepted him as righteous. It was over this, this, this child. So, Isaac is the child of promise, not of natural origin. And this is spoken as an allegory, meaning there are, there are characteristics of this story in Genesis that match the problems they're having in Galatia. That's what this really means. For these women are two covenants, one coming from Mount Sinai, bearing children that are slaves. We're talking about the Mosaic law given on Mount Sinai. Now, Paul's going back and assuming you're following his argument. From Deuteronomy 27, 26, it says, if you don't keep the whole law, you're cursed by the law. So the Mosaic covenant given on Mount Sinai is the will of God to reveal God to man. It is the will of God to show man how he ought to live in society. But it is not the will of God on how you ought to be saved. So the children who are coming out of the Mosaic covenant, the Jews, are not right with God on the, based on the Mosaic covenant. That's what he's saying. And then he says in verse 25, that is Hagar. Now, Hagar means Mount Sinai in Arabia. There's been a terrible hair pull here about what that means. Some say Hagar represents Mount Sinai. Some say the Arabic name for Hagar is close to the Hebrew word rock, which was a symbol of the mountain. Now, I don't know exactly why this is here. There's even a manuscript problem here that could even probably remove the word Hagar, though I think the Hagar is in the original text. We just, I think, represents is the best we can do. And this corresponds to present Jerusalem. Now, here's three things. Hagar, the handmaid, the, the, the mother by natural consent, stands for the Mosaic Covenant given at Mount Sinai, and that represents earthly Jerusalem in the present time. Earthly Jerusalem functioning in Judaism in Jesus' day. Okay? Let's go a little further then. For Jerusalem is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above. Now, in a, in a, I'm getting excited. In Isaiah 65 and 66, we're introduced to the new Jerusalem. Think of all the times in Isaiah. There's a new song. There's a new name. There's a new city. Ah, it's wonderful. It's this new city of Jerusalem that represents the children of the promise. Think of the number of times in the book of Hebrews where it says Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, not made with human hands, eternal in the heaven. That's the city we're talking about. And it's this heavenly Jerusalem that is the, the type or the example of the promised children because it's godly in origin, not earthly in origin. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother. For the scripture says. Now this is a quote from Isaiah 54, 1. In context, this has zero zilts to do with this Abraham, Hagar, uh, Sarah typology. In context, this is the account of, of Jerusalem being destroyed in the Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar II in 586 B.C. And she, she was just totally destroyed. And the thing says, better is you who've had no children. But one day you're going to have... It's the promise of the restoration of the city of Jerusalem in the post-exilic Persian period that's going to be a beautiful city again. Now, the connection here is the word barrenness. Sarah was barren. Sarah was barren. Sarah was, It looked terrible for Sarah. They tried all different ways to have a child. But finally, God gave them the promise. So too the city of Jerusalem looked empty and empty and empty and empty, but God in his will uh, fulfilled his promise. And that's what I think this quote's about. Then verse 28. Now we are brothers like Isaac, or children born to fulfill the promise. What a wonderful thing Paul is saying. These Judy had been saying, now you've got to be circumcised and you've got to become a Jew to fully be a child of Abraham and a Christian too. Paul says, no, 
We are already the descendants and brothers of Isaac if you've trusted Christ by faith. Gentiles, you're as really Jewish as any Jew that ever lived. Because real Jews don't come from physical descent. They come from promised descent. It's not the Mosaic Covenant. It's the Abrahamic Covenant. It's not the law of Moses. It's the law of Christ. It's not human effort. It's God's grace. And by God's grace, we're full members of the family of God. Yeehaw! What a verse. But just as then the child born of ordinary course of nature persecuted the one born by the power of the Spirit. Now, this seems to be a reference to uh, Genesis 16, 4 and 5. Now, boy, this is a toughie. It looks like that in Genesis 4 and 5, the boy Ishmael is an older boy, maybe a young, young teenager, maybe a little bit less, is playing with Isaac, a little toddler. Now, the Hebrew has the word laughed or maybe played. And if you just read it through, it just looks like that Ishmael is playing with Isaac. I mean, that's the way it looks. But Sarah gets mad at what she sees. Now, some say, Jews make up all kind of things, that uh, Ishmael was playing like he was shooting arrows at Isaac. Uh, uh, the Jews say it, the, the word laughter means mocking the young boy. Whatever reason, Sarah gets mad and nervous about Ishmael being there, and she says, Abraham, send him away. Because apparently Hagar and Ishmael had been making fun of Sarah. And Sarah wants that boy to be given inheritance, and that's the common way of the day, given inheritance and sent away before the real heir comes of age. And that was, that was the way we learned from archaeology was done in that entire set. So Abraham wasn't being unloving or unkind. That's the way it was done. But Sarah's jealousy or her motherly protectiveness instigated that and said, now's the time to get rid of this other boy. Before they have real jealousy and real problems, send him and his mother away with some, some funds to take care of them the rest of their life. And that's what this is about, I think. So it's, it's a, does the word laugh mean mock? Well, that's, that's way, how it's interpreted. What does the scripture say? Drive off the slave girl and her son, for the slave girl's son shall never share in the inheritance with the son of the free woman. Now, I think this whole point is, Genesis 21, 9 and 10, drive away Ishmael. The Judaizers represent Ishmael. Drive away the Judaizers, I think is the whole point of this. But, so brothers, we are children not of a slave girl, but of a free woman. And if you remember at the time when I was preaching on chapter 5, many think the first part of, of chapter 5 should go with chapter 4. Because it looks like there's a play here between the slave girl, and, but of a free woman, that in chapter 5, 1, this is the freedom which Christ has made us free. Do you see the threefold play on the word free? Free woman, freedom, and freed. And some say that's intentional and we shouldn't break the context there. And that may well be because our, our chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. So Paul is using allegory. But I think he's using it in the sense of a typology instead of the sense of allegory. So I would like to take just a moment in this the closing opportunity to talk about um, ways to interpret the Bible to maybe quickly say to you what I think is a proper approach, because I have been exemplifying it for you in my sermons and in my teaching, but quite often I don't think you realize the uniqueness of what I'm trying to do and why I'm trying to do it. So let me just go back quickly at this point and, and, and try to summarize why I do this the way I do it. First of all, I want to say that I believe that the, the real sense of the Bible is in the plain, obvious, ordinary, common sense meaning of the text. Does that make sense to you? I think it just means exactly what it says, and it says it in a very simplistic way. I'm not saying they're not hard texts. I'm not saying they're not words we don't understand. But the Bible is up front and open, and everybody who heard Jesus speak, and everybody who heard Isaiah speak, understood what he meant. Now, we're removed from t by time and culture and language. It takes us a little more effort. But it's the, it's, the, it's the writing for the common man. Number two, I think we are, have to be tied to the intent of the original author. I must understand what Paul meant. It doesn't matter what Bob means. 
My mind is committed to the authority of Scripture, not to my intellect, not to my culture, not to my denomination. I'm going to go with Paul if I can understand what Paul is saying. And so I've got to link it to the author's intent. The text itself is the focus. I've got to be able to show you from the text why I say what I say. I can't just say to you, well, I think it, I, I hope it, I, I feel good about it. I've got to be able to show you why, so you can check me. There are so many reference works available to Christians. Most of us are so biblically lazy that whatever is said from a pulpit, we swallow it as if it's gospel. Amen or oh me. You're responsible as a hearer for what you hear. If you don't, if you don't learn to critically analyze uh, in prayer and scripture search, what people say to you, false teachers will eat your lunch because they are dynamic personalities, smooth talkers, logical presenters. And if you can't self-feed on the Bible, you're always vulnerable to every new fad and every new hot shot. There is no more joy in all my life than knowing the Bible for myself. Now, I, I know I'm wrong, and I know i got problems with it, and I know mine's, my theology is not God's theology, but oh my, when you know the book for yourself, you're just not blown around by every strange wind that comes down culture or denominational pipes. We've got to be able to show. Why? So that I, so I can at least limitedly verify to you where I'm getting what I said. Does it fit the history, history of the day? Does it fit the flow of the argument of the book? Is it, is it in context? Is there something unusual in the way it's stated? The grammar, is there something there that points to a certain meaning? What does this word mean in its own day? Not somewhere in the past, but in its own day. And is there another clear biblical passage that helps explain this obscure, uh, uncertain passage? Because the Bible does not contradict itself. Do you believe that? And the best interpreter of Scripture is... Scripture. So, uh, I think that's where I'm coming from. And I think once you see that, then when I try to say to you, this is a present tense, or here's a good parallel, or this is a first class condition, that is not meant to ever, ever, God help me, ever show off to you. I don't have to show off to you. But what it's meant is, if you don't like what I say, or it hits something you never heard, you need to go check it. Hallelujah. And there are ways to check it. And checking it is not calling some other preacher and say, what do you think about that? That ain't checking it. You've got to get the book out. You've got to know the book. You've got to search the book. The bottom line is the book is where the authority lies. Not in the speaker. Not in the place. It's in the book. And we've got, got to go back to this book.